Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom? My name is Eric, and I'm here with Killapalooza watching Michael Kester. That's what I am, that's what I do. We have uh, multiple movies on the show today, which means it's once again time. Yeah, uh, we call that uh, a Killapalooza, and uh, the basic idea behind Killapalooza is a palooza of killing. If you're not familiar with the term palooza, it's uh, an innumerable number. Now, as a filmmaker yourself, how many feature-length films would you say you have under your belt currently? Um, made or watched? Uh, that you've created yourself? Probably somewhere between I haven't done any and... Okay, but what about just feature-length films just that you have written? Written? <laughs> um, that have been made into films? Not quite. Okay, so what about just the feature-length films that you yourself have just directed? All you did is you showed up, you directed, you made that film. Um, zero. Still zero. Great. Mm-hmm. So we're even on mm-hmm. that. I have directed zero feature length films. So let me rephrase this entire thing. Okay. Today we're going to watch five films that are better than anything collectively you and I have ever done. That's true. And uh, those films are from the Silent Night, Deadly Night franchise. That's right. A franchise that uh, you at home, dear listener, have not watched. That's true. <laughs> nope. You no. have not if watched you have, these if films. You, if you came to the show uh, with... You can stop right there. They didn't. Yeah, they but, just there's no but if they came prepared it, uh-huh. a prepared listener a prepared member of podmanity showed up today having watched the first film okay that's fine i'll um, accept that nobody saw the other four and... so there's spoilers and chapters in this usual thing we do here um i have i have one one suggestion uh and it's not watch these movies the suggestion actually is there's something very important and um i don't i'm not really sure how to phrase this so maybe maybe you can help me a little with this sure our show is broke again. Yeah. All right. So here's the thing. We didn't want to start doing a please donate every time mm-hmm. thing. Because it gets annoying and we don't have anything to give you right now. Yeah. We we just, we don't have, I wish we, we, man, we fucking planned. We were like prizes or things we could do. We just, we have nothing else. Yep. We are out of time, resources. Popcorn. We are barely scraping together. There are minutes until the show needs to <laughs> be on the internet. We have nothing left, uh, but it's a Killapalooza. Yep. I know everybody likes the Killapaloozas. That's, everybody that's except consensus. you and I. Yeah, right. Loves the Killapaloozas, and we have agreed already to keep doing them. Yep, that's happening. So I said long ago when we first started doing donations, I don't want to start doing a thing where we go, all right, we're going to stop if you guys don't give us money. Right. I don't want to hold the show for ransom. Sure. Ultimately, the show is something you and I do because you and I want to do the show. Yep. So uh, let's let's not lie to ourselves or the audience there. We're going to keep doing these shows. But I, I don't know. If we can make the Kill Up Blues episodes, the Pledge Drive episodes, sure. you know, if you didn't donate last week, that's fine. And if you don't donate next week, totally okay. But when you are listening to this Kill Up Palooza, if we could just maybe try and pay a server bill or just get another pop screen for a microphone, yeah. really anything we could do to make this show take less time to produce and continue to try and get it out uh, every middle of the week, that would be awesome. Donate.doublefeatureshow.com. Save the, I want to say save the Killapalooza, but you're not really saving it. Right. Make the Killapalooza less of a pain in the ass so that the movies, by comparison, can be more of a pain in the ass. So we're going to spoil the films, but you don't care about that. There's chapters between the individual movies. Skip on to the next movie. Skip on to the end of the show. Skip to donate.doublefeatureshow.com. Hell, just skip to next week. I think uh, that would make Silent Night, Deadly Night, Uno, the, uh, Part the Uno, first, please. first film. I think it's just called Silent Night, comma, Deadly Night. And uh, if you fuck in the orphanage, you get physically abused. That's true. So this is, this is the infamous, controversial mm-hmm. uh, Silent Night, Deadly Night. Right. That besides from delivering these great religious uh, morals, you know, about growing up in a religious environment and uh, that being a spectacular place to raise a child... <laughs> Um, I don't know. Let's let's start notability, right? Because yeah. we have to. This isn't just I don't know the very last slasher franchise that has five parts that we haven't right. already done. It's true. We there have... is a reason that this is an important franchise, right? And that is because 
they haven't made a movie about an Easter bunny that rapes little boys. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's... Uh, and, you know, you made that joke before. I guess we should kind of explain where that came yeah. from, right? So there was all this controversy about this movie. And, you know, I planned when we originally did this, I was like, oh, great, we can talk about this. And then as I'm watching the movies, I fall back into slasher dumb into mm-hmm. celebrating. I'm excited about these movies. Right. I'm excited about what they're doing. I don't want to bring the show down with a bunch of fake fucking get over yourself controversy. So I'll make this brief. Great. This came out. And there was uh, this uh, sacred quasi-religious icon known as St. Nicholas. Oh, I thought you were going to say Roger Ebert. No, not Roger Ebert. But that's, yeah, I guess that's a big chunk of it, too. That wasn't a fat joke. I just want (laughs) to, I want to make sure I'm totally in the clear on, I'm going to take him to task for some very particular stuff. Not a time to make fat jokes. That'll be every other episode of Double Feature. So Santa Claus, it's this child icon and people have their, um, you know, society has this kind of don't fuck with the children sure. mentality that we've talked about before. Save Not the to children. be confused with don't fuck the children. Yeah, we'll get I into guess that. We agree in, with. Yeah, number five, we will. Uh, yeah. yeah, and also something we agree with. Don't fuck the children. But uh, messing with children in film, totally fine. And so we take this childhood icon, right? This, you can't say there is no Santa right. on TV. Sure. And you create a slasher franchise based around... What's supposed to be, you know, everybody thinks Santa, they think good time. They think innocent, and they think youth. They yeah, think we don't want to taint the memory of happy, Santa Claus. Happy, gentle, old man. How dare anybody mess with Santa? And so this film comes out, and this is in a time, of course, where just the holidays are getting fucking slasher movies. That's just what slasher, uh, slasher films are doing. In still being set in the 80s and in trying to make a cheap buck... That's, uh, you know, it's a really cheap idea to go with. Mm -hmm. Uh, What do we do? We start another slasher franchise that we can do around Christmas. Or just a slasher movie at the time, not a franchise. Right. No one planned for a franchise. Never a franchise. Even by film five, they didn't know there was a franchise. No one ever plans a franchise. So when the movie comes out, there's an uproar. The fucking PTA or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, people are just mad that their children are going to now associate Santa with this horror film. Yeah, because all the kids went out and saw a Silent Night, Deadly Night. Yeah, right. So, like, I don't think that it's... I don't think they're worried their children will see it. I think they're just mad it exists. Yeah. So, Siskel and Ebert uh, famously said that, you know, the film... That all the money that was made on the film was blood money. Blood that was money. the term they used, right? The fucking ridiculous... Blood money. Mm-hmm. The term blood money. Blood money is that that's a phrase that you use when you profit off of hurting somebody else, whether it's by directly. I mean, blood money is often used when you kill somebody. Sure. Uh, to pay a hitman or whatever, but yeah. also, you know, just in general. So I guess they're saying either what the filmmakers killed a bunch of kids or they killed Santa Claus. Yeah, I don't know. But, you know, it's one of those things, like, I don't want to get too caught up in verbiage, mm-hmm. because I very loosely use the term rape all the time, somebody right. raping an idea, when actual, uh, literal rape is far worse than anything I've ever, you know, used that as hyperbole for. Right. So, I, I guess I can't take him to task too much for using a term like blood money, although we're talking about human lives yeah, versus... Yeah, well, it just seemed, blood money seems a little bit alarmist. Well, that's the thing. Ultimately... <laughs> You review fucking movies. Mm -hmm. Blood money? Come on. But they really wanted to drive this point home. So, you know, on their stupid fucking show, they read off... You know, they had the the show where they give a a 30-second synopsis of a movie, show a trailer, and at the end say it stinks or put a thumb in the air. Right. And uh, people tune into this to see... Nobody tunes into this. So, sadly, people do tune into this. That's why people know about this. On the air, on their dumb little show... They had this thing where they basically read off the credits to the film, mm-hmm. and after each credit, they said shame, shame, to each person who mm-hmm. had made the film. So it's kind of like uh, it's kind of like a a brilliant new nineteen eighty Red Scare, yeah, but just <laughs> yeah, something like completely that. Completely connected to Silent Night, Deadly Night. Yeah, that's kind of rad. Ironically, the only fucking shameful thing is their goddamn show. And so uh, another infamous uh, kind of critical review of that was saying oh you know the last the last good honest thing on the planet saint nicholas which Mm -hmm. totally isn't the last good honest thing on the planet but whatever um is now gone what's next the easter bunny you know as a child molester i think was a i don't even remember the name of the critic that threw that out there i think that's an amazing idea and i'm gonna make that film Uh but i've told you that a million times so that's part of the controversy of this title and honestly if we're to turn this around and kind of hold this up in a triumphant way, 
the fact that this had controversy is probably the only reason there were five movies and that we're doing the show. It's probably the only reason anybody saw it. To be honest, it really doesn't do anything with Santa Claus. It doesn't do anything to Santa Claus. It doesn't do anything with directly with the myth of jolly old Saint Nick. Yeah, that's it's not never actual Santa Claus. Yeah. yeah. It's a guy who's wearing a suit. There's two different guys that wear suits that happen to, to do a bunch of killing. And to be completely honest, how many people who dress up as Santa Claus in the history of time have ever done anything wrong? Years later, bad Santa comes out and no one complains. Years later, Santa's sleigh comes out and nobody sees it. <laughs> um, so here's what I want to talk about notability wise. So let's let's get off the controversy thing. That's not actually the notable that's what, um, you know, looking at this it's movie the from seed afar. of notability. <laughs> yeah, right. That's why it's notable in culture. But I think there's something this does as a slasher franchise that compared to our other franchises, our other Killapaloozas, is a lot different. Which is give a bloody box cutter to a little girl. Before that even happens, which is also amazing. Long before. All of, uh, all the backstory here where is this all coming from it's a lot of backstory it is it's about uh i don't know um based on another film in the series i would say approximately 40 minutes of backstory yeah right but yeah we have there's actually two separate sections of backstory we get the original 1971 backstory of the santa claus Weird robber thing in the car. raper right. killer and uh psycho vegetable grandpa yeah don't forget grandpa i was gonna say that's an important part too um and then flash forward to growing up with the uh the nuns yeah sure in the orphanage yeah this is run by mother superior this is a crazy amount of backstory i mean it begins to seem absurd when you're you know 20 minutes in and you're going we're still not in the 80s right What are we doing here? And I had seen this movie before, and you hadn't seen it. And Mm -hmm. I remember we were in the 1974, um, I think it was about the time he was watching the the only consensual sex in the entire franchise. Sure. Before Mother Superior comes in and starts beating the shit out of everybody. Ruining everything. I said, completely not thinking, I said, there's a fuck ton of backstory in this film. Sure. And then I realized that maybe you thought this was where the film was and that we were going to remain in 74 and the killer was going to come to the... Definitely. Yeah. And so I didn't elaborate. Right. And I immediately recoiled and was afraid that maybe you heard me and knew what I meant. No, I have no idea what you're talking about. So then, yeah, we get through all this backstory and then jump to present day. Well, so I'm wondering the whole time. I mean, I know nothing about right. this outside of all the shit the critics said. Um, and you know, like I said, what it's yeah. on the surface, uh, known for being, I don't even know who the slasher is. Right. I know at some point there's probably a Santa and he probably kills. Although in my head, I'm conditioned to not even think that because sure. we've because seen of Halloween three. Well, we've seen what's happened with the other Killapaloozas, yeah. right? A lot of time the titular character maybe isn't even in the franchise. Maybe right. it's not about him at all. So I'm going through this and as Which one is Hellraiser, we're getting all of this backstory, right? And I'm thinking, where is this going? Who is our killer? I mean, uh, when we finally figure out that the protagonist we're watching is truly, you know, the slasher in this particular movie, that's really unique. We've never watched the birth of a slasher from the very beginning. That's true. You know what I mean? We go back a lot of times. Well, and we get the the Halloween circa 1978. Mm-hmm. with the really quick first person baby Michael Myers kills right, his family. Right, But that's it. We don't get... But we're already introduced to him as a killer. Right. We that's, don't get that's an how upbringing. We're learning we don't get the backstory. We don't get the, why are you so fucked up? Yeah, and there's a lot of notes to that. There's, uh, you know, uh, stuff you've talked about with Grandpa and seeing his mom killed. And uh, that scene that plays over and over, that becomes... Part of a staple for at least the first three movies, mm-hmm. seeing the shirt ripped open right. and the neck slit, and um, eventually working in what has to be the single most joyless toy store ever. Yeah. I mean, it's just a warehouse. Iris Toys. A, a poorly uh, lit warehouse with shelves And of the toys. windows all painted over. There used to be a place near our studio called Pizza Factory. I don't know if you remember that. Uh, I roughly remember that. It was a pizza place, but it literally looked like a factory. Uh And they had no menus. And I don't even know if they made pizza. It was just a crack (laughs) den, right? They just sold drugs out of it. Uh, Eventually, it shut down or it got boarded up or whatever happened there. (laughs) But the toy store reminds me of that. Mm -hmm. It's just this empty fucking place. Completely utilitarian. Toys on shelves. Buy toys. Goodbye. 
But that's because we're not on the warm side of the door, really. <laughs> not yet. What is that montage? There's a. The, it's a music video, is yeah. what it is. Yeah. It seems well, we like... we have to see that Billy's all grown up. Right. Well, not only that, we have to see that he is an all-around good guy. Yeah. He's the best worker, doesn't drink at work. You know what, Eric? He punches out his time card and still straightens, still straightens up the, the box. Yeah. Yeah, but we get past that, and it becomes a slasher film, I would say, very quickly. Oh, yeah. For a film that's not a slasher film at all up to that point you know we see a santa rob a store yeah uh it becomes a slasher film really quick it's one of these things where it's uh, it's kind of interesting if you are to put yourself in the position of the other characters it's almost that you have accidentally found yourself in a slasher film right you've looked around and you've said okay we work in this toy store that kind of looks like a warehouse and maybe that's part of our fault that we work in an abandoned warehouse and there's a bunch of co-workers and we're kind of drinking and we're flirting with each other, and we're locked in after hours. And we brought in this new guy. Right. And at the point where there's a kill, you would wake up as a character, look around, and having seen these other movies, think, fuck, I have created the perfect slasher right. film all around me. How did I not notice that, fuck, we're doing a slasher film right now. This yeah, is what's happening. Right. <laughs> God damn it. So he's just picking them off one by one at that point. It's, uh, it's almost funny in how generic it's instantly become, and you didn't even see the elements coming together. They right. just all happen to be there. But we kill everybody from the initial warehouse, mm -hmm. and then we have to uh, start what, you know, the movie goes back into absurd territory. Yeah, it does. We're just going to random home invasions. Yeah. And, uh, and, you know, I, I become a little proud of the movie at this point. That home invasion, for as much bullshit as it yeah. is... You know, it's not the most bullshit, because there's also a scene with some random people uh, sledding right. on virgin, what is it, virgin, virgin snow. snow? Clearly not virgin snow <laughs> at all. But up to this moment, we've probably had more breasts than kills in the sure. movie, which is yeah. also okay. Thumbs uh -huh. up to that. Way to go, well, movie. Breasts always have an edge, because a kill always takes one person, and you get two breasts for every one woman. Oh, right. So you, you think automatically the numbers game just isn't working yeah, out I there. Think, I think it's the, always in breasts' favor. I think the odds are stacked... In Breast's favor. Stacked, really? You're going to use the word stacked? Artfully. But somehow, Breast always come out on the losing end. They have a two-to-one advantage and lose every time. So kills will win out in this movie eventually. And I think that's when you know we start to get into random home invasion. Right. That's the scene where I really feel like, all right, we did a lot of building up to this moment, but the movie has found its its stride. Sure. It really, know, this is its, uh, its moment here. It's time for punishment. It is time for punishment. I, the moment where he kills the woman on the antlers. Right. Uh, we're watching, I guess we should mention, the uncut version. Right. Which is the version with the footage that has not been color graded. Right. With the footage that looks like no one gave a shit about uh, it. Similar to the My Bloody Valentine Yeah, if you've ever seen edition. that. It, yeah. yeah, I mean, about the same years that yeah. they're coming out. It really looks very similar. But the antlers going through her stuff, the whole, that whole scene is just really, really well done. And uh, I think what makes it even better is the moment you get right after that, where he's coming up, uh, you know, the kid is asking questions about Santa. We mm -hmm. see that a lot throughout these movies. Oh, the kids see Santa. They don't know Santa's a killer. They all get really excited sure. that Santa's showing up. Yeah, so this little girl kind of walks out. The girl that's, what, being babysat by the right. promiscuous duo? Yeah, we also have a you know a babysitter kind of sure. scenario, right? And she walks out, and Billy is ready to just, just slaughter her. He is prepared for punishment. Yeah, wants to know if she's been naughty. And he continues Weird. to grate her. Have yeah. you been naughty? Are you sure about Are this naughty sure? thing? Yeah. Not naughty at all? What about a little naughty? And at the end of the entire conversation, she admits that no, she has been 100% good all year. So should she get a present? And Billy reaches into his pocket, pulls out a bloody box cutter <laughs> and hands it to her as a gift. And she gives him a weird look and he smiles and walks oh, away. It's so perfect. It's probably my favorite scene in any of the movies. You know, we're rooting for the kid to die and knowing yeah. the whole time that the kids will never die in these movies. None of these movies is, is going to pull that. But uh, this may be better, giving the yeah. girl the bloody box cutter. So something weird starts to happen at the end, where uh, this whole time, you know, we've been uh, so used to the formula of following around a bunch of teenagers. We don't actually care about them. We want to see them killed. Right. But here, since we are actually following the killer, they are the main character. Sure. They are the protagonist. We're following their story. We have to have an antagonist, and right. that's Mother Superior, right? I guess, yeah. There's this weird dichotomy that ends up happening where Mother Superior is 
she's simultaneously this force that you hate mm-hmm. and this figure of benevolence. Right. 100% good. She is a fine, religious, upstanding Christian. <laughs> sure. And that also makes you hate her. Right. So I we end up at the end of the film. I was struggling internally with, should she survive or do I want to see him just absolutely brutalize this old woman in a wheelchair. Yeah, right. You know, what does the film want me to feel? What do I actually feel? Yeah. What conclusion would make... You're not even really sure what you're rooting for yeah. at the end. At that point, you just end up with two forces that are going to collide. And at the end of the day, you know that really the outcome that happens will be the one that you're okay with. Yeah, he's got this axe out fire there. Axe. Axe is, yeah, the fire axe is such a Matches great his weapon. Outfit. Um, you know, he's going to cut off the nun's head. I mean, I guess you kind of know just watching this. The death he's priest not- has been shot. Yeah. Or is it a janitor? I think it's both. That's how we're going to rectify number one and part two. So we have a, a little bit of a blasphemous uh, kind of event. But then are we going to cut a nun's head off becomes mm-hmm. the question. Can the movie actually go there? And uh, he's, you know, yelling about punishing the nun. His punish, fucking punish, tagline, punish, right? Naughty, punish. Always punish. Just weird. And uh, and the nun starts shouting back, there is no Santa, which to me is the gratifying part. Oh, yeah. In just front of ye- all the children. Yeah. Just yelling there's no Santa in front of children is uh, critical thinking wise. I mean, the best. I don't really care what happens physically in the yep. movie. I'm just glad that that happened. Absolutely. And so I don't even remember or care how it ends. Thankfully, there's part two to remind <laughs> me. Okay. We've seen this before. We've well, seen it. I don't uh, know if we've ever seen it this badly. I, we've quite literally seen it before, but <laughs> Silent Night Releasing Corporation presents. We already know we're in trouble because there's clearly a company just dedicated to pushing out another part of the Silent Night, uh, capitalizing on the controversy of the previous one. Oh, so very much. So we have a slasher recap. Hey, you know, not off the table. Totally no. fine. Sure Everybody does every it. Time. To a degree, they always go back and explain the story of the previous film. Whether it's with the, except three, for with the exception of Hatchet Two, which we covered. A little Jason, some Meta Freddy. We get it with Leprechaun. It's all over Halloween. If anybody who made any of the Hellraiser movies had seen the other Hellraiser movies, I'm sure they would have done it. <laughs> uh, so we have to recap a little bit of the second movie. On previous Killapaloozas, we've uh, kind of debated why they might do this. Uh-huh. If there's a production angle. I'm not going to recap our own show here yeah. and drag you through that. Until the end of the year. If you guys donate enough, we're going to do a Killapalooza Palooza. And we're just going <laughs> to listen to all of our Killapaloozas and do a go. show about them. There you go. So this movie has a... I'm going to say that uh, part two of this franchise, which isn't part two. It's Silent Night, Deadly Night 2. That's what this is. If there is any movie in here that's really notable, it's not the controversial first one. No. It's the double, uh, I'm not going to say controversy, but I'll say double notability yeah. second one. Double notoriety. Absolutely. Really. <laughs> and uh, the first one is the lesser known thing. We'll get to the better known thing uh-huh. later, which is amazing. Probably the best known thing in the entire franchise. Oh, God, it's so good. But before that, we have uh, well, something that we all know really well, Yeah, which is that uh, we watched the first film again. Yeah. Now, all right. So we have Ricky is our new character. Uh-huh. Played emphatically, or at least his eyebrows played Absolutely. emphatically by Eric Freeman. Eric Freeman. All right, let's 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 triple up the notability. Eric Freeman is hands down the worst actor that's ever been on Double Feature. Yeah, no, absolutely. You're going to hear me say that other times. I know we've said that before. I would say the three worst actors. But uh, we, yeah, listen, I'm etching that shit in stone right now. The worst fucking actor on Double Feature ever is Eric Freeman. I mean, it's... He would be the distracting extra, except he's the main character. Right. The well, there, main... Is, there are distracting extras throughout this franchise. Oh, God. He just... All right. Eric Freeman and his crazy goddamn eyebrows <laughs> uh, will have their moment, but they can't have their moment for about 40 minutes. <laughs> it's true. Um, Ricky is the baby in the <laughs> previous film. Okay. I'm are sorry, you ready? Are you just... ready to do this? <laughs> this is so ridiculous. Ricky's the baby in the previous film. Uh-huh. He's now the main character. Was right. the baby, now the main character. Sure. Which is okay because the last movie ends on Ricky, sort of. It ends on uh, a character who then we find out is Ricky. Yeah. It ends on an awkward extra making a face in the background yep. who, yeah, who is uh, Ricky. And so they set up the next one and they want to tell a story about Ricky, kind of. Uh huh. That's okay. They want Ricky to tell a story about his older brother that Ricky was not there or aware for. We're being really coy about this. Yeah. Let me say this as bluntly as possible. Ricky narrates through small bits of voiceover 
a synopsis of the entire previous film using footage from the entire previous film from start to finish. Over 40 minutes. Yeah. He, uh, he finishes up, I think, around 39 minutes. Yeah. Um, there are small sections. I'm going to give him as much credit as I can. <laughs> there are small sections where they cut back to him making crazy brows. Yeah. There are small sections. I mean, I want to give him as much credit as uh-huh. we can. There are very <laughs> small sections once in a while where they break from recapping the previous film and show just a couple minutes of crazy brows. Right, with his psychiatrist, psychologist, or caseworker. So basically the formula here is tell me the story of the previous film. It shows a really long scene where they basically, I mean, they cut the movie in half. They take yeah. out about half the scenes, show the entire movie with half the scenes missing. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so they show a clip, comes back, says... Okay, and what happened next? And then he sets up another clip. Sure. And they just do clip after clip sure. showing the whole first movie for 39 minutes. Right. Now, the thing that's really bizarre about this is for the former part of the film, Ricky was a baby. Yes. And the latter part of the film, Ricky was not present. No. So for whatever reason, Ricky has some omniscient ability to know what was going on with and around his brother. There are even scenes that... Ricky recants that no one he's ever met right. were there for. No one who was even alive to survive them. Right. So we're not seeing through his eyes. We're just seeing the fucking previous movie. It's just showing us the whole movie for the first half of this movie. This is the longest. This is really the most ballsy one of these we have ever seen. Yeah. I don't think uh, anything will ever top this unless it's... I mean, when we talked about the hypothetical sleepaway camp that was going to reuse previous footage... Even that, had it come to full fruition, I don't think would have even challenged Mm -hmm. as much footage that was reused for this movie. There is a Gamera movie that might give it a run for its money, but I don't think it does it as obviously. This is basically challenging Shogun Assassin for if it used as much footage as the (laughs) uh, the original one that it's from. So this is crazy. He's a baby. He's retelling the story. And I'm trying to think, all right, where is the movie going with this? What is its eventual... I mean, once we finish out the story... What is it going to try and pick up and do? And so this is kind of the fucking crazy thing. When it finally gets to wrapping up the first movie, and I mean, I I can't state enough how much it's just re-showing. There aren't like additional angles, different scenes, different more focus on Ricky. It's just an abridged version of the first, a slightly abridged version of the first movie, which was okay because we got to see the actual antler scene and how that played out in the original cut and not the... uh, the uncut version. But that was the only good thing that Mm -hmm. came out of that. And then they sort of recast the kid in the very final shot and try to continue Ricky's story up to the moment. Now, this isn't the last. They're not done with showing footage from the old movie. So we get Eric Freeman breaking out, his character breaking out and uh, causing havoc in the world and killing people, which is kind of where I thought this might go, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, what other fucking story are you going to tell? And uh, they go to see a movie, him and his girlfriend. It's the first movie. Yeah. (laughs) They literally go to a theater and watch more clips that we didn't get to see already in this movie (laughs) from the previous film. Right. If this wasn't fucking ridiculous enough, with the crazy brows going the whole time, Uh right? This guy's eyebrows just bouncing all over the place. His acting is like a parody of a fucking parody. It's ridiculous. He's in this movie theater, and he chills the fuck out for just a couple minutes to allow us to watch some more of the previous movie. Uh Uh-huh. Instead of getting his voiceover, we get the guy in the back row of the audience making jokes to his buddy about what he thinks is going to happen next in Silent Night, Deadly Night, Part 1. Yeah. We now have a extra character voiceovering the first movie because our our eric freeman has disappeared into the audience right (laughs) it can't get any more ridiculous than this oh i think it can i think the only way that it could get more ridiculous is uh would it be uh laundry day would that be how it would get more ridiculous Uh, laundry day would be maybe saint patrick's day would you say yeah uh garbage day i think (laughs) i'm sorry what day did you say that was garbage day (laughs) that's um, so I feel, uh, I feel like this is so unfair to you because you were not aware of yeah, this meme I had no idea. before this movie happened. I flipped the fuck out when this happened. 
I'm a big fan of memes. I really like the, uh, not the memes themselves so much, but the study of the memes. Sure. There's a really great series called Know Your Meme, or that used to be Know Your Meme. I don't know. Somebody like bought it, and I don't know what Isn't happened. Is it like meme-based now? It's, uh, I don't know. You can Google Fuck it. if I know. Um, but you can find out where these memes came from, their societal impact, what they kind of say about internet culture and uh, collective mindset. And more importantly, the stars of these memes and how this stuff came to be. And the collective mindset of this is Eric Freeman is a crazy person. And, and the worst actor of all actor. time. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so this scene, this garbage day scene, I mean, uh, how would you describe this in case somebody has is not aware of this yet? It, uh, he has a doofy blue sweater on. Uh-huh. He and just... I recognize that as the pieces were coming together, almost like we talked about in right. part one, in uh, film one where you find yourself in a slasher film, I found myself in a fucking internet meme yeah. that I knew in the back of my head existed, but <laughs> didn't know I was watching that movie. He has a doofy blue sweater. He kills his girlfriend. Uh-huh. He kills a cop. He goes on a revolver rampage through yeah, he's this got the gun in his quiet hand. suburban neighborhood. Ready to go. Just starts rampantly firing at all these dudes, because uh -huh. there are no women in this sure. suburban neighborhood. Uh, I believe they're all in the fourth movie. Yeah, sure. There's one guy who's taking his trash out, and you see him lift up a trash can. Much to our surprise, Ricky is standing sure. in the distance sure, behind sure. the trash can. And eyebrows a flaring right. shouts, garbage day. <laughs> and then <laughs> shoots the guy through the garbage can. Then laughs, does a cowboy style spin and blow off the muzzle of the gun. Then walks as the camera orbits his head and giggles some more. Yeah, in context... You've seen so much of this ridiculous character, right. you're not quite... I mean, if you watch it, do this right now. Go to YouTube, go to our website, we'll probably have a link. We should just put it by bad cat. Yeah. Uh, we'll have a link to it on the episode page. It's a 15-second clip of what's happening here. And it's almost even better if you haven't seen the it's movie. It's probably better. Because you're so used to how over-the-top terrible his acting is and his character. I feel like, and I've been trying to pin this down since we started watching these movies... I feel like he's emulating something. Yeah. I feel like it's part Terminator, part mad scientist or something. Yeah. You know what I mean? So in the script, he obviously has to give a maniacal cackle, but he also has to feel like he's detached from humanity. Sure. We have no idea. You know, he's a fucking robot, right? He's an android and he's walking around. He feels no emotion. He's a cold hearted killer or a terrible actor. Well, and that's the thing. So he's delivering this, this sort of ha ha ha. This, this right. fucking deadpan kind of maniacal. He's just forcing it. It's a read of a laugh. Yeah. And uh, and then the crazy intense. It's supposed to be intense. Uh -huh. um, eyebrows and the look he gives and that out of the side fucking side eye thing that he does. <laughs> and then just shouting garbage day. It makes, <laughs> it makes no sense. It really makes little sense in context. It's no true. sense out of context. And is often on the, uh, you know, number one in the spot of worst scenes of all time in anything ever. And this movie may be worst, worst movie of all time Quite in anything probable. ever. If, uh, if it's not, it's because it's not actually a film, since it's just a short tacked on That's to true. a recap of right. the previous film. Garbage Day. Amazing. Tagline trivia. Silent Night, Deadly Night 3. Uh, it's it's the, the, the fucking post colon title of the yes, film. Don't. Better? Better watch out. There Better you go. Better watch out for Bill Mosley's fishbowl head. Oh, the, yeah. Uh, hey, Bill Mosley. Well, what are you doing there in that film? <laughs> this is not Sleeping. who I expected. So, you know, we're, um, we're in the, what, late 80s now? We the are, next yeah, film I think this was 89. And, this one was 89. So next films are going to be 90 and 91. So these three all come out within a year of each other. Bizarre. Direct-to-video kind of... Uh, go ahead and try and find these direct things. Direct to video, probably for three and five. Direct to garbage can, probably number four. Oh, Jesus. Direct to Clint Howard's collection. So when we do these movies, when we do these, uh, these uh, fucking, they get more and more obscure. These exponentially kind of, uh, more obscure. Right. As the number goes up, the obscurity is exponentially increased. I'm always looking for who do we know in the kind of web of double feature dumb who has done these movies before? Um, there's something that's tragically been pushed off over and over on our show mm -hmm. uh, that has a tie to this movie. Strangely, I, I think his name is Monty Hellman, right? Yeah. The guy who did the cult classic exploitation movie, 
two lane blacktop. I believe it's the only Criterion road exploitation film. And although he's not uh, credited on it, he worked on the Corman movie The Terror. Okay, so which I'm is ex- in this film? Yeah, yeah, the movie The Terror does show up in this movie. That's right. So if you know this guy, I mean, this is kind of a, a weird movie to see that he's done. I don't see a lot of his signature in it. It's just very, very strange. But then Bill Mosley pops up as a name. Right. And while Tulane Blacktop has been robbed of our show over and over, uh, Bill Mosley films left and right. Yeah. Repo the and place. the Chop Top stuff. And um, the, Texas Chainsaw 2. Yep. Yeah, and the Devil's Rejects and the other Halloween. Bill Mosley all over the fucking place. Now, maybe we haven't heard about it because he spends most of the movie in a coma. Right. And even when he's out of the coma, he's still in the coma. He's a zombie. It's it's really a bizarre role. His only line is Laura. Oh, no, he has another line. <laughs> right. And a happy new year. Yeah. What the fuck is that about? I have no idea, but he's wearing a nice tuxedo. He is. Let's forget that happened. This is a supernatural film. We had a natural Santa, guy in a Santa suit, yep. got an axe, shooting people, taking out the garbage. And now we have a supernatural thriller. Well, where, this is uh, still... Oh, no, I guess it is. Cause I was going to say, it's, sti- it's, it's science fiction, but then there's the whole Dario Argento blind chick with psycho power, psychic powers. I mean, both the content and even the tone of this is supernatural. You know, you're in a dream state uh, all the time in this movie. There's this heavy New Age kind of right. score going on. There's the uh, the only Santa in the film takes place in a dream. You know, in mentioning Halloween left and right, I mean, this is very Halloween 2, white room, expecting a fucking horse and Sherry Moon zombie right. to total skull all up in here. So how much Santa are we dealing with? I mean, are we really getting away from the Christmas theme here? Where do you where Where is this on the radar? There's very, very, very... Very little Santa. There's a that weird, creepy dream state Santa, and then I guess the movie takes place on Christmas time. Uh, we so where does Bill Mosley fit into this? Bill Mosley is bizarrely enough actually Eric Freeman. Okay, <laughs> right. Uh, excuse me, sir. Ricky is the character's name. But if we say Ricky, Ricky people are going to get confused if they've seen all five. You're right. Never mind. He can resemble Ricky in the same way that uh, Superior can be recast in the previous film. Yeah, I mean, he could be Ricky, he could be Mysterio. It really could go either way. The fucking fishbowl on (laughs) his... He has a a juicy brain dome thing going on. Uh, Oddly, this not being the Stuart Gordon movie in (laughs) uh, in the lineup. He's in a coma, and they're trying to tap into his brain dome. Sure. So I'm feeling uh, I'm feeling part of that reanimator stuff already. Right. Well, they're trying to they're trying to attach they're trying to reach his old uh, his old memories, which is achieved by showing clips from the original Silent Night, Deadly Night movie. We are one made in Manhattan short of the cell right now. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's exactly what it is. We're uh, we're gonna go into a psychic fit, and we haven't mentioned something about our psychic either. She is blind. She has no eyesight. Add a little more edge to your movie. Just make her blind. What what is making this girl blind? Okay, we've we've set up the script. <laughs> well, Eric, she we have can't a blind. <laughs> Wait, thank you. My sentence got away with me there. I didn't mean what makes her blind, but the fact that we have made her blind. Why do that in our script? What's the point here? It raises the stakes. First off, apparently she doesn't realize that Ricky has a dome for a head. Okay, um, <laughs> sure. Also, that it makes terrifies her, her later. A lot more vulnerable. She's just constantly in a panicked state of everybody's picking on her. Sure. All right. Which gives her an excuse to kind of be an asshole. All sure. The time. But it also makes her an outsider. So there is that moment where you get the almost maybe she's an outsider and he's an outsider and they're about to connect. Ew, he has a bull brain. <laughs> sure. Right. Well, yeah, because they have this connection where they could sort of see what each other are doing or whatever. And there's that strange tie. There's that uh, bond between them because she has sight when she's in the psychotic visions, too. So, hey, that's kind of cool, I guess. Except she's trying to murder her or something. Ruin her Christmas Eve, I guess. I don't know. She's killing her granny. But the movie loves that it has a blind protagonist. It's so into... I mean, the blind person imagery all throughout the yeah she's a fucking the movie she's not watching i guess because she's blind it's got this guy his eyes are bleated they're pecked out by a bird or something yeah. i don't remember what bird happens eats his eyes and the now or even thing with the sight later yeah, right. shooting out the get it whacking the see. pinata yep that was a long lasting light bulb for uh the glass being broken one of the strangest moments in this movie for me is 
I kind of lose track of who's dead and how they died. Yeah. Eventually, you just get to the point where you just assume all the characters are dead except her. Sure. And then characters keep popping up. To make Memorex jokes? Yeah, well, there's the Memorex joke, which uh, I, first off, didn't understand the purpose of the delivery. Back when people use optical media, Memorex was a format that allowed you to uh, to burn things onto what was called a disc. A, right. uh, I think it was circular diskette CD. Is right. What that not what that stands for. Um, but before that, even before that, further yeah. back in time, Memorex made these sort of uh, magnetic reels that people yeah, could sure. copy their very similar, podcast onto. Very similar to uh, what Ricky's voice was recorded onto in the uh, previous film. You got it. And so there's uh there was some tagline about Memorex. Is it live or is it Memorex? Sure. Or is it a bullshit one liner in the third Silent Night, Deadly Night movie? It's okay to date your movie if you're sure no one will have even heard of it three years from now. But the other thing that happens in this film that I think is supposed to make a point and ends up falling just completely off the face of the scope of the universe of this film. Sure. Okay. Is we have this hardened shoot first, ask questions later cop. Mm -hmm. The guilty until proven innocent cop. Sure. And then we have her doctor, whose role switches so dramatically for me. So I don't know if you remember this, but this is something I just didn't understand. Sure. The cop asks, why didn't you pull the plug? Why didn't you let uh, Ricky Mosley die? Right. The doctor says, even his life is worth something. Sure. And then later on, they're in the car, and there's this ridiculously nihilistic, everyone's stupid, no one deserves to live, fuck this, this is bullshit, I hate life. Yeah. And it's just- Such a cynical outlook. Yeah. And then he shows up, and you get this wonderful Ahab moment where Scoople in the stomach, and then I guess that's it. There was supposed to be some arc there that I think just didn't happen. Wrong Ahab for this series. That's true. You and I both really wanted the nun to be an yep. Ahab and the the sort of attractive nun, sure. not the crazy old nun right. uh, from the first movie. But never really happened. And so our movies continue on with their kind of twist ending tuxedo. Don't know what the fuck is going on there. <laughs> um, such a poor ending that the next film just chooses to completely ignore it. In fact, <laughs> ignore the entire franchise. It ignores it. It seemingly ignores the universe. It almost has to ignore the universe. Silent Night, Deadly Night Four. No, that's not the title. Uh, what is it? The Craft, I think it's called. Uh, Witchcraft Five, I believe. Initiation is the name of the film. Initiation colon Silent Night, Deadly Night Four. This is the first time we get a slasher film in uh, the middle of a fucking franchise that that has the cojones to put the <laughs> sure. franchise title after its own title you know i don't know i felt like there was a hellraiser movie that might have done I think, you know i pay no attention I think the to... hellraiser titles just dropped hellraiser <laughs> yeah right yeah after a while they're like ah oh, fuck in order to get the funding we technically have to put pinhead somewhere in this yeah. movie all right so this is definitely bordering on what may be the most obscure movie we've ever covered we've had obscure movies sure. before. We did Hard Rock Zombies. Yeah, I mean, we want to leave the movies in their place in obscurity, so it's probably best not to even mention them. But the movies you skipped over, you chaptered over, those are the obscure ones. There was actually one, I feel really bad about this one too, Uh, when we did the McVeigh tapes Uh a while back, and we said, I said, I'm going to take full fucking blame for this. I said, hey, go ahead and steal this movie, because there is nowhere you can find it. We watched it on YouTube or something. Yep. Um, without paying anything to the people who made it. It aired on TV once, and I could not find it anywhere. I was lazy. It's on fucking iTunes. <laughs> you can, not only is the movie, uh, the McVeigh tapes, on iTunes, um, it's $2 or something, $3. It's in HD. It's part of the... It doesn't even matter. Just go look for it, and you'll find... Totally buy the McVeigh tapes. Or donate $2 you, to Double Feature. No, buy the McVeigh tapes if you're only going to do one of those things, because I feel awful um, about that. This movie, on the other hand, you can't fucking find this anywhere. You we can get we an, couldn't find it. We found the majority of it. You can get an out-of-print uh, DVD or perhaps VHS of this film. So this film uh, stars um, 80s superstar um, of rock and roll high school fame, and I guess his brother's pretty popular too. Uh, Clint Howard Yeah, right. is the superstar big name in this film. 
Before we see him, we see our protagonist fucking, right? That's the actual open of the movie. I can't remember which. No, I'm pretty first. sure the first thing that happens is Clint Howard with a cart walks out oh, of a an alleyway, finds a cheeseless hamburger, burning woman falls from the sky, he pokes her, uh credits. You never get the cyclical cheese though. That's a shame. <laughs> there is no cheese wheel. How great would it be if the movie ended with that? But when we meet our protagonists, they're fucking. Which, I mean, why wouldn't you start there? Sure. Such a cool way to start meeting these characters. I like these people. All right. This is probably the most I will like them through uh, the entire movie. So, Clint Howard, Mm -hmm. who shows up everywhere. You've seen him in stuff on our show before. You've seen him on television before. Yeah. Um, He's in Star Trek. He is really the, probably one of the more famous people, with the exception of next film, I guess, Mm -hmm. um, in the franchise. But not in a way like we used to see these stars show up in an old obscure slasher movie and then become famous. This is just sometimes he checks in and does one of these slasher movies. Totally fine. No one's judging him. He was really big in the horror community in the late 80s, early 90s. He was the ice cream man. Oh, was he? Yeah. Oh, I had no idea. Yeah, he still pops up and stuff from time to time. He was in some of these other, uh, Brian, is it Yuzna? Brian Yuzna? Brian Yuzna, yeah. Uh, Movies. The guy who's... He was the producer and director on, uh, actually producer for a bunch of Stuart Gordon stuff. So I should be clear, Stuart Gordon doesn't actually have anything to do with this movie. But uh, from what I know, maybe he does. I don't remember seeing Stuart Gordon anywhere on here. I didn't see it either. But Brian produced a bunch of Stuart Gordon stuff. I mean, From Beyond and Honey, I Shrunk the Kids and all the reanimator stuff. Um, He was actually the producer and the director for the second and third, what was it? Uh, Bride, Bride of Reanimator, Reanimator and, and Beyond Reanimator? Beyond Reanimator, yeah. The 2003, uh, mm-hmm. I think it was Beyond Reanimator. And the Dennis movies, too. The he ones did the that, Dennis? Yeah, I remember Corbin the- Burnson? That has the, like- Those the, are great. Uh, the needle teeth yeah, braces razor thing teeth. on the cover. Razor teeth. Stuart Gordon wrote at least one of those movies. The Dennis wrote both of those. great. I love the dentist. So we've seen Brian's stuff on the show before, specifically with Reanimator and From Beyond, which, by the way, I still haven't seen From Beyond. That continues to be the only movie we've done on the show that I somehow didn't see. <laughs> and uh, one last name that will be notable for our show, which is Screaming Mad George. Yeah. He did make up for one of the... Actually, I think it was one of the Killapaloozas uh-huh. we did. Um, Children of the Corn was the, I think the episode specifically where we talked about him. Was it, did he do, uh, the uh, Carradine had friend Williamson face? Yeah, probably. That's or Ken probably, Foray face. Yeah, that's probably what happened. Um, he did Predator, stuff in Predator as well. Um, a bunch of the Stuart Gordon stuff, the fourth, I think it was the fourth Nightmare movie. So we talked about him, uh, pretty extensively on Children of the Corn, or as extensively as two people who don't know what they're talking uh-huh. about can talk about someone who's a professional. Which is approximately 40 minutes weekly. I think if he has a resume piece in this entire movie, it is a woman crawling naked through piles of roach gore. I think that's probably... That whole fucking thing is disgusting. When we get there, I just think to myself, I'm so glad we're watching this. Yeah. I am so very glad. Um, There's roaches in this movie. There's roaches in witchcraft. I was going to say roaches and feminism, but it's not so much feminism as mad lesbian witches. Yeah, it really is. Jilted lesbian witches. So the roaches start in the apartment, small bugs, and then there's just a weird... I believe the roaches start in a giant ceiling pipe. (laughs) Well, there's... Yeah, pulling it out of of the rooftop pipe. I don't even know what that thing is, but it's awful. It's a larva. It's Larry the Larva, who we see later. Oh, Jesus. So these roaches start to, I mean, really go up in size and in sliminess and in (laughs) uncomfortability. And then there's just more nudity and eventually the nudity and the roaches combined. And we're in the scene where it's just red and gory and naked. And and her legs become a tail. What's happening? Her fingers are getting away from themselves. I mean, I don't, uh, when we get there, looking back now, I go, how did we ever end up here? It seemed like a natural place to kind of end up. Although sure. it, there was a, an abstract moment as I'm watching this where I really did sit there and go, look at what I'm watching right now. Yeah. Where did this come from? Yep. I mean, did you kind of have, it was, well, it, was it, uh, it was a very witchcraft out of body experience yeah, for me. Something like that. Well, there was the moment where I turned to you and I said, in the scope of <laughs> films, sure. in the scope of cinema history, this isn't that strange. But this is Silent Night, Deadly Night 4. (laughs) Yeah, right, right. And so where we are right now is a completely bizarre territory. Silent Night, Deadly Night what? Silent Night, Deadly Night incantation. Uh, I don't remember seeing any Silent Night, Deadly Night. 
Uh, two instances. One in the title, sort of. Sure. And the other on television. <laughs> I can't help, cannot help, but think back to Halloween 3. Yeah. Where we were sitting in, I think, a bar or something, yep. watching Michael Halloween. Myers yep. on television. Absolutely. Well, also, there's the staples of it's apparently Christmas time. Yeah. And Clint Howard tries to hack through a door. Yeah, that covers uh, pretty much everything. So we have something completely separate from the other movies. We're no longer following the same characters, except there's someone named Ricky, who I'm fairly confident isn't supposed to be the same Ricky, but okay. who knows? Well, that would have been a cool the, place the, for him to What about the, the Ricky in the fifth film? Same Ricky? Different Ricky? I'm just going to say it's always Third the Ricky? same Ricky. All it's, Ricky? It's funnier to me if <laughs> this is just the misadventures of one Ricky. <laughs> of What's Ricky his last Caldwell. name? Caldwell. Caldwell. Garbage Day only comes once a week. That really should have been its own spin-off series is the problem here. We didn't have a we still don't have a Garbage Day franchise. So in much the same way when we talked about the third Halloween. I mean, uh it's possible people haven't heard that. What was the background there? Why third Halloween, no Michael Myers with the exception of a, a cameo on a television? Sure. What was the idea? So the idea is very similar to the idea that we, I still want to continue to push. Go back, listen to our trick or treat show. Oh yeah. Um, trick or treat. Great it's example. Basically the same idea that we want to have happen with trick or treat. And if you make films, if you like to make films, if you want to make films, get your hands on some rights to trick or treat, yeah. go back, do that. But essentially John Carpenter came up with the idea of Halloween. The Halloween franchise is not about Michael Myers killing people. It's about horrific things that happen every year on Halloween. Right. Different event, different town, separate, probably separate universes. Sure. The first Halloween was Michael Myers, and the second Halloween film was the part two of the same night. Right. Halloween 3 was supposed to be a different event, completely independent, that happened on Halloween. John Carpenter wanted to start doing yearly Halloween movies that would just have these odd one-off events sure and that would be whatever the halloween movie happens to be about this time turns out john carpenter was wrong and they are about michael myers yep. that's what whoever is in charge of these things if we are collectively through ticket sales i believe his name the, was mustafa akkad <laughs> the producers are responsible for whatever reason halloween stuck with michael myers and the third film became this one-off weird thing and if i think about it as trying to create a tradition i love the idea of the fourth Silent Night, Deadly Night film. I love Which is the, a I, silent production, I believe. A silent film. And then what's the next one? Still, Still silent, silent. Still silent films. Uh, just production company pumping out Silent Night, <laughs> Deadly Night films. Has to keep changing its name like it's... Uh, well, it's because they have to declare bankruptcy. It's, it's in and witness and protection the, or something. Start the company again. Yeah, right. Speculation. All based on speculation and not fact. So I think about, all right, every Halloween, there's already going to be some kind of... Not Halloween themed, but there's going to be horror films coming scary out. Scary movie. A ton of them. Sure. That's just the time for this. What happens. Whether it's scary movie, which is not a horror franchise sure. at all, and rather just a or pile Saw, of shit. Or Paranormal Saw, Activity. Great. Or Apollo 18. Uh, I don't believe they made 18 of those Apollo films. Yeah, Ridiculous. I know. Someone's sending us a correctional email already. <laughs> so Christmas, we've always mentioned. And again, doing this movie uh, in the time we are doing it and not around Christmas we don't give a shit about Christmas. Right. Not even the only thing that might happen at Christmas is a lot of Oscar bait films come out. Yeah, exactly. So there might be more, um, I'm not going to say important, but uh, more popular stuff sure. coming out around Christmas. You go to the movies on Christmas Day and you see stuff. So I would love the idea of, yeah, let's try and get a yearly Christmas themed lampoon uh, fest. Yeah, just some kind of, you know, horror movie something going right. every Christmas. That's fine. That's I think it should be a weekly or monthly horror movie thing. Well, let's not I'm getting tired our... of waiting for like three, four months for horror movies. Too to come ambitious, out. sir. Far too ambitious. There's so many people in the world, Eric. So we start going around in circles or spirals, perhaps. We start going around in spirals, trying to figure out the movie sets it up. It's a mystery we're solving. Apparently. It's spirit fingers. That's what we're doing here. Mm -hmm. We want to find out... Spontaneous combustion, question mark? Ricky and the mystery of the missing cheeseburger. Ricky, spontaneous combustion. Ricky and the spontaneous combustion conundrum. There we go. And so we spend the whole movie trying to solve the mystery. We get into these adventures. We become immersed in a coven full of witches. And we An have... An oven of witches? Uh, but by the end, we really... We started to Da Vinci code these fucking pieces together... We write about our... No, we, we have no idea. We yep. have no fucking clue. And someone has to just tap us on the shoulder and go, ah, uh, she was my daughter. That's... Yep. Yeah, you, you know what? You're not even close. 
I'm sorry I wasted an hour and 20 minutes of your time. But here's the answer. She uh, burst into flames because she was my daughter. And then I will subsequently burst into flames and fall off a roof. You guys win. Happy, happy, joy, joy. Fought so hard to solve the mystery and just fucking lost at the end. So this is another strange one for us because uh-huh. we end the series in 1991. Right. With Clint Howard. Or which, no, that's uh, the previous... Hmm. Yeah. Now Clint Howard, again, doing... Okay. Reprising the role of Ricky, making it clearly <laughs> a, I don't know what's going on with Clint Howard. I can't answer that question. I don't know what's happening. Okay, but there is somehow, somehow in cinema, a bigger name than Clint Howard has made its way into a film. I can count on one hand people more famous than Clint Howard. Yeah, but, what's that? Uh, Mickey Rooney. Okay. Geppetto. Well, Pinocchio. Uh, all right. Stop with the Pinocchio. Stop with the, no to movie. Stop with the fucking Pinocchio. It was getting heavy-handed. It was, okay, I get all your Pinocchio references, but actually, <laughs> it was saying, uh, hey, I'm just kind of hinting at the end here for you. Right. There's a big thing we don't expect at the end, and right. that's Pinocchio. But Mickey Rooney is in the film. He's the toy maker, I guess. Sure. And He's Joe Petto. He um, has done a million films He's over done the last films. million years. Over the last 100 years. Now, we don't have a lot of luck with stating that people are alive and then them dying before right. the episode comes out. We have awful luck with that. Apologies to Mr. Hopper. And Mrs. Murphy. Oh, Jesus Christ. But I'm not a superstitious person. I don't believe these things come in threes. And I'm sure with this episode going up in about a minute and a half now, uh, that uh, he'll probably be fine. Mickey Rooney yeah. will be fine. He's Everybody, still alive. Mickey, well, you as know, of the sound of my voice, he is ninety years old and still alive as ever. We're safe because I think he's shot for the Muppets. Okay, and we can still claim he's alive and well until that comes out. All right, great. So this is number five, the Toy Maker. Is this feeling a little familiar, franchise wise, to you? Uh, it feels like a combination of Child's Play 2 and The Leprechaun 3. Ooh, interesting choices. I'm thinking uh, Dollhouse. I'm not sure why I'm thinking Dollhouse. Uh, maybe but... because of toys and the fact yeah. that it's an inane last installment of <laughs> sure. a rapidly decaying franchise. Just an attempt to throw one last <laughs> bag of cash at it. Yep. But people are coming back. You know, Screaming Mad George comes back. He because comes back. Brian Usna to, even returns. Yeah, right? Clint Howard's back. You're just loving you some Clint Howard right now. Tranya. Well, so here's the thing with Mad George and Usna that I'm really liking here is uh, they get to play with toys. Yeah. And from, you know, all that Brian did in here, I shouldn't say all that he did. He produced and wrote it, which... More than we did for it. Is certainly. <laughs> certainly that. And uh, also... Also, I think I was three when this movie came out. <laughs> just saying. So no it's excuse, not that I didn't sir. want to, it's that I, they wouldn't give me the job. The writing is all the kitschy, cool toy stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, the production, we talk about producers so much when we do slasher franchises. And uh, the effects as well. I mean, the kills, uh, this is what changes the tone of this movie a little bit from the other movies. The kills are kind of silly. Yeah, they are. They feel a little lighthearted. They seem a, a little wish mastery, maybe. Yeah, a but, little a lepre- leprechaun. Remember Leprechaun Two, where the guy goofy. wishes he had all the gold and it showed up inside of his stomach. And I just remember Ill. a guy wishing he would go fuck himself. That Wasn't was, that how that happened? That was Wishmaster, yeah. So the kills might be silly, but they lead to. I mean, what if we were to describe these kills on air? Might sound like the weirder. They wouldn't sound. Um, it wouldn't sound really even any less weird than the bug goo previous stuff. Sure. I mean, there's a, there's a scene where, you know, two people are fucking or attempting to fuck. I'm not yeah. sure what's going on there. He, they're well, the one they're doing that teenage dry hump thing. Yeah, right? they're dry humping. The dude gets his ass fingered by a hand, but she won't let anybody touch her vagina. Totally cool. Teenage dry hump. Fine with that. But as they're doing this, the toys are attacking them. Sure. So it mixes that weird uh, pet wanders in the room while you're having sex right. kind of thing. Uh, that's awful. But then also it, danger, right? You're being attacked sure. by toys. So they immediately obviously have to stop what they're doing and all these toys are firing on them. That all sounds super bizarre and fucked up. But on film, maybe I'm going to sound like a weird person for doing this. This is just a collection of audio recordings where I sound like a creep and uh-huh. a weirdo. But it's kind of fun. Yeah, it you know is. It's, it's a really right? good time. You, you yeah, would share that sure. idea, right? Well, the, I think the best part about it is that the their selection of toys, right. they weren't contrived, weaponized things that nobody has. They had the little crawling army guy, except he shot real bullets. Mm-hmm. And then they had a tank. You know, They had toys that 
every kid had in a bin of toys he didn't actually play with. Sure. But sure. that he had accumulated. Right. They're bullshit toys that would wind right. up in the warehouse. Exactly. Or the, uh, the... They're the toys left at the toy store yeah, at, yeah. at the end of the day. So the abandoned toys are all attacking. And it's fun. Yeah. It's these people who were having fun naked, and now they're defending themselves from monster toys. From the onslaught of violent playthings. Yeah, and just something about how playful that scene is. Sure. Seems like it was fun in writing. Right. And is definitely fun rewatching it, and treats the sexual material like, hey, not a big deal. Well, yeah, and then there's that other scene earlier in the film that's really funny. It's uh, it's clownish. Mm. The scene where the landlord is in the car. Right. And Larry the Larvae makes a secondary <laughs> appearance. This right. time he's uh, animatronic. Sure. More obviously. And he keeps crawling toward this guy's leg. Sure, right. Seemingly to bite him. And the guy goes, stop that, and scoots him away. Right, right. Repeatedly. Until eventually he attacks his mouth and sucks his eyeballs in and then hangs out in his eye. Ugh. And it's this really gross, weird kind of... Ha ha, I got the last laugh. Sure, sure. And then the car crashes and explodes. It's making me think, and you know, this happens all the time. We start invoking these films and then I associate them. I know there's a lot of Stuart Gordon ties. And I know that it's not all, you know, intentional. Some of it is accidental. But I'm so reminded of Stuart Gordon just doing some mixture of kid stuff, fucked up stuff, and naked stuff. Yep. And even when you listen back to that music box show, just in talking to him, how casually he discusses, you know, fun nudity on the set and trying to cover up private parts when the producers are around and just putting all these elements together as if it's uh, just kind of an obvious choice, <laughs> as if it's, oh, you, of course you're going to have toys and naked people and mm -hmm. fighting and, and it's going to be funny. Yeah, yeah, and Mickey Rooney. Mickey Rooney playing the, uh, who ends up being not the antagonist. Right. Uh, Mickey Rooney ends up being the thin bastion of defense sure. uh, between the world and the antagonist. Okay. Um, it's the Pinocchio thing coming sure. back. So it's, I feel like we need to step back and kind of evaluate what's, what we're literally seeing in this last scene. Yeah. Because I'm going to, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to, once again, you've been identifying with me really well today. So I'm just going to put myself out there a little bit further. This batshit insane ending happens. This fucking what were they thinking ending happens. And I really like it. Yeah, me too. Really? Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't. I, well, it's it so has, weird. It has an eerie Indiana feel. It okay, feels sure. like a Saturday morning. Joe Dante, another yeah, name I'm thinking just, of a lot as we're watching this. I just really like the this is what's happening. Oh my sure. God, what a bizarre reveal. Now sure. you have to deal with it. Right. Um, yeah, we find that it is, uh, it's Pinocchio. It's yeah. just Pinocchio. It's an, it's a, it's a android. It's a fake boy wanting to be a real boy. Who killed his father because of that. That's, I mean, cause that's how the Frankenstein story goes, right? Yeah. yeah. Create life. Life destroys life. Sure. He kills Joe Petto. Uh huh. And then assumes Joe Petto's identity in order to, Commit some antics and steal In a, a way boy. that's kind of... I, I don't want to use the word tactful. I don't want to say it's tactfully sure. done, but it's done in a way... I mean, maybe it is tactful because the movie evaluates what you expect from it. Yeah. And it does just a little bit better in yeah. revealing that. It does a way where you don't say that's so astonishing that it's incredibly notable in effects history, but the way they do this reveal, it's not nearly as campy. Right. Yeah, it just fits right in with that world. It's extremely well done. Mm -hmm. Going from one person to another person, Mission Impossible yep. style. And you don't feel too betrayed because you're really not too married to either exactly. character. Exactly. In fact, the only thing that really happens that has me kind of cock my head in confusion mm -hmm. is when the little boy is pretending to fuck his mom yeah yeah no see i love that even more yeah because it plays off of the uh pinocchio real boy sure weird sexuality thing yeah this Can't sort fuck of him with a nose right fuck him with your hump i want to be a real boy he takes his pants off he has no genitals and the movie just kind of forces you to address that weird thing yep in the same way as a uh, bedroom dry hump toy yeah. scene in an even better way yep. uh, than that and then he pushes that even further to the point where, I mean, the movie is trying to have its uh, its last hurrah, its major twist, fucked up ending showdown moment. And so to bring that just past where you should ever be comfortable, there's now a human doll attempting to fuck this kid's mother. 
Mm -hmm. outside the realm of okay, still kind of goofy and funny. Yep. Totally ends up working out. And we get a meat cart to end up the film. Meat cart, the great, great tradition of double feature (laughs) that is not used nearly enough. A double meat cart, actually. Yeah. I think he's going to stab the boy in the bag, rips the bag open, and turns out boy is in another bag. Yep. Sex, reanimator, call out, meat cart, the whole thing is super fucking hip. And that's how we end Silent Night, Deadly yeah. Night in 1991. Yeah. And choose to never come back to it. Ever. That's fine. I feel like the fifth one is, is, uh, is uh, it's a strong contender uh, sure. in the franchise. First one, fifth one. So we have a very easy recap then. Mm-hmm. We have Silent Night, Deadly Night 1. The controversial, shouldn't have been controversial, but awesome that it was. Sure. Silent Night, Deadly Night 1. Which was really, I mean... I thought by the time it picked things up, it was a great slasher yeah, film. I loved it. Not that anyone gives a fuck what we think anyways, yep. but a great slasher film. Sure. Um, the second one being Which is the... Silent Night, Deadly Night Redux. Yeah, right. Just the remix of the first film with some additional crazy meme shit at the end. Also great, I guess, because it's crazy meme shit at the end and right. our show eats that stuff up. Uh, third one... Mosley Bowl. <laughs> Mosley Bowl. Being really a step more into an artistic direction. Yep. Also a supernatural. Very Italian giallo feel. I yeah. mean, I, I'm not saying that to mock the film. I think it really maintains kind of a giallo, fulci. It's that mix of the slasher stuff. Yeah. You know, when you look at American slasherdom, that's when we're dealing with the end of the first movie. We start to go more into Italian slasherdom yep. with uh, the third movie's kind of a pseudo intellectual layer. This sort of we're saying something artsy about the mind and right. the mental bond, but we're actually not saying anything because someone is wearing a plastic bowl on his head. <laughs> Bringing back around to a fourth movie, uh-huh. which is Silent Night, Deadly Night 4, Season of the Witch. Close enough. And that being our branch out and our anthology film and loving it particularly for that reason. And then the fifth one being Toymaker. Awesome. And just fun and awesome and sexy. <laughs> not sexy at all not even a little sexier than uh, crawling through some roaches or you half and half i don't know where to go from half and half i guess we have a website uh which is double com and an email address where you can send us your take on the silent night deadly night series of the ones that we have planned for this year that we are attempting by the way to acquire funding for donate com. of the ones we have planned this year probably the most obscure um, yeah, well, I would definitely say, yeah, probably the, the most only obscure. one we've never really mentioned on the show before, right. I think. Um, we have some other big stuff that'll be coming up the rest of the year. A lot more mainstream, a lot more current yep. in uh, some of the cases. A lot of stuff that people have been begging for since we started yeah. doing Killapaloozas. This is this year. This year's Killapaloozas are a good gamut of kind of the whole spectrum of oh, what are going to be so very good. I am really, really excited to do these. Me too. Makes me just want to do them all week after week, but we we need to space them out. Um, We are still trying to collect funding, as I mentioned. Essentially, we need to pay for the server for this year. We need to uh, pay for a couple pieces of currently broken equipment, but stuff that I'm hoping nothing else breaks for the rest of the year. Ever again. Fingers crossed on that. Um, I'm having a little bit of a Lion compatibility thing with our input. Inter- no one cares about this. But the right. box we use to record stuff doesn't really work under my computer. So I'm not really sure what we're going to do about that. We're currently, we have it all splinted together with wood sticks and band-aids. And <laughs> it seems to be holding okay for now. But I know it's going to explode in a second's time. So don't donate the other weeks. Donate this week. Today is our pledge drive. We put out the Killapalooza. We have no incentive, but we're just going to offer you this cool show and hope you offer us some cool monies at the end. <laughs> Donate.doublefeatureshow.com. Um, so we're doing Closer and Happy Go Lucky next week. Good enough for me. Watch more fucking film. Bye. <laughs>